everybody welcome to blockbusting the podcast where we love to hate the movies i'm your host jay light joining me all the way from uh is a secret underground lair in mexico it's kyle Mexico, roger gridley hola bienvenidos damas y caballeros como estas jay you okay how you how's your day going it's good it's good yeah yeah bien bien y too <laughs> it's going it's going all right dog it's going all right nice Nice, nice, nice. I'm thirsty, hanging out here, Mexican internet. You know, I'm pretty, pretty disappointed. Right now. We made good pesos for it, you know? Good, great pesos for this internet. But, you know, sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm always uploading things. I'm always like, you know, I'm, I'm, I tape a lot of comedian sets, you know? If I'm ever oh, out, yeah. I have a lot of data on my computer. We have a lot of hard drive space. So I'm always recording people's sets, and I swear to God, to send like 500 megabytes of some dumb comic dick joke takes like three hours sometimes. It is ridiculous. That's crazy. But hey, listen, that hap- in LA, we're getting internet that's just as throttled too. So don't even sweat it. It's well, crazy keep- going back to like my parents' house in Texas. <laughs> anytime I upload a video, if I'm visiting them, it takes for like a two gigabyte video, it will take 10 minutes and it takes two hours on my internet. Uh, that's just depressing. You know, when you're here, you know, I'm from California. Whenever I hear Texas does something better than us, that just, it just, there's a part of my heart that just really rips out. I know. Well, there's not that, there's not enough people. There's not many people in that area of Texas. Is there a lot in the, well, so they live in uh, like a hundred mile radius and a hundred mile radius. Oh yeah. Definitely. They live, they don't live in the sticks. They live in uh, a major metropolitan area. The Dallas Fort DF- Worth Metro. DFW. The DFW. DF dub. What a, what a great acronym. Gosh, what a great acronym. <laughs> yeah. But there's, uh, you know, bad, bad internet here in LA, but Hey, nothing we can do about that. Well, you know, the, the quality does matter. And, you know, when you watch something with a poorer quality, sometimes it can misshape your true perception of what's going on. You know, look at that, a smooth, a smooth transition to the movie <laughs> you wanted to talk about, which I also watched for the very first time when I was a teen in the Metroplex It <laughs> is David Fincher's infamous fight club. 1999 American film starring Brad Pitt, Edward Norton, Helena Bonham Carter. Or as I call her, that bitch. (laughs) Based on the novel of the same (laughs) name by Chuck Palahniuk. Um, Wow. I mean, I I told a bunch of people that we were talking about this movie today. And how could anybody hate it? How could anybody hate this movie? Exactly. (laughs) And I, I, after listening to, uh, well, reading your notes and rewatching it, I can, I can see why, you might hate it. It's got. It sounds like it's a very personal. Uh, it had to be de- like a deep scarring effect on you. <laughs> well, it's like you know. Sometimes you know. As I love your podcast, Jay, and it's you have a very like uh, you know. It's like a sarcastic sort of attitude that I really you know enjoy listening to. It's like a kind of a. There's like a softness, but a sharpness. It doesn't upset me a lot. So whenever, but I but I hear you say I hate this movie and. You know, hate such a strong, powerful word, isn't it? Sure. Hate it has like you know. Are we even allowed to hate? Are we supposed to hate? <laughs> I think. Uh, I mean, it definitely it it makes it harder to get guests sometimes. Whenever you're talking about like, oh, I want how how do how can I hate something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, people think it's an unallowable emotion, but you know, it's ever so more common, isn't it? Yeah, it's like. You know that um that old Louis C.K. bit about uh, people saying things are hilarious. Yeah, yeah, sure, hate, of course. Hate kind of feels like it's got that uh, that kind of stank on it now, where it's like <laughs> you can say a little twist, a little, yeah, you a hate curveball. a thing, but really you're just like you're uncomfortable, or you dislike it, or you are off put by it. It may disgust you. Oh, there's a lot of shades to the negative umbrella of hate that it's kind of hard to, uh, to swim through because you don't want to swim through your negative shit. Yeah. You don't want to deal with it. You don't no. want to, you don't want to, you don't want to accept that you may be filled with negative emotion. You don't even want to, you know, deal with the fact that you could be truly upset 
and you needed to address it. You yeah. don't want to, you don't, you don't even want to think about that. You don't even want to think about that. I do. I remember the, one of the earliest episodes I ever did was the Jumanji remake episode. Oh, well, that, that movie is hateable as fuck. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like all of my friends who I told that I hated that movie, they're like, why? It's so fun. And, me, and my guest and I were both like, do we just hate fun? Like, we <laughs> just not get on board and like, you know, lo- bottomize ourselves in our movie yeah. seats for a sec to enjoy Chris Rock or not Chris Rock, The Rock and Kevin yeah. Hart. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's a way better movie if Chris Rock's in that bitch. If Chris Rock was in there, why why is it why is it not V Rock and Chris Rock ever team? Yeah, I'll, I want to see Chris Rock call a zebra the N word. I want to do. I want to see that. <laughs> I want to see that so bad. I think you just watch Madagascar to see that in the hey, outtakes on the hey. DVD. Are there really d- outtakes where he says the N word? There better be. I don't know. The only <laughs> DreamWorks DVD I ever owned was Shrek. Ah, and Shrek too. <laughs> I, you know, those movies kind of flew by me. You know, you, you do watch a lot. You do watch some movies as a kid and they kind of like, you know, they, you watch them, you enjoy them, but they just pass right through you. But yeah, Fight Club, definitely not one, definitely not one of those movies. I, I, I saw that movie when I was 11. 11. Oh my and God, man. Is that yeah. okay? Is that I okay that I, <laughs> it's, you know, Fight Club is, is one of those movies that I feel like if you saw it that young, I could see how it would. Fuck you up. <laughs> really fuck you up. Which it's like, that's basically what happened to you, right? You, you watched it. Like, what was your experience? Like, how did, how did fight club come into your 11 year old field of vision? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I think we've talked about this first, Jay, but you know, I went to a Christian school for seven years, my mom and family, very, you know, I wasn't, you know, I, I was a lot of things I wasn't allowed to watch. Mm-hmm. Like I, I was never allowed to watch the Simpsons, Same. Uh, Harry, Harry Potter, Okay, I got Harry Potter. Harry Potter was okay, yeah. but well, no my, yeah, yeah. well, if my mom knew about what you know, J, J.K. Rowling thinks about trans people, I think she would be more accepting <laughs> to me watching Harry Potter now. But at the time, definitely, you know, was, I was definitely I grew up out of the, out of that culture. There's a big culture of evangelical Christian. We all hang out. We all ride ATVs in the forest and talk about Jesus. Do you know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we get we we get on our dirt bike and we talk about the Lord. Yeah, we were more about like water slides and roller coasters than ATVs in the woods. But, you know, like church groups all still have to have some sort of level of extremeness to them in order to, to make you be like, you know, that feeling that's God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, adrenaline. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Anyway, so I was going to Christian school and I didn't I didn't know much. I mean. Maybe the the worst, you know, because you can't, you can never really get away from pop culture. I guess you know, Dave Chappelle was really popular. Dane Cook, Chris, you know, Carlos Mencia, all mm-hmm. very popular. You know, the Fifty Cent. You know, of course, I guess I listened, but there's a lot I was never exposed to, and I definitely, you know, brought that naivety toward sure. you know with me everywhere I went. And I remember I was uh, taking uh, ninth grade math. Okay. Algebra one. Gotcha. And I was in the, I was in, the, I never did well in math. I mean, maybe I'm good at it now, but I just, you know, I just didn't care for homework. So I got put in the dumb. Sure. I got put in the I got put in the dumb math class, but also I also was taking the math class with older students who had failed it before. So I had a bunch. I had maybe like six tenth tenth graders in my ninth grade math class, okay. and you know, gosh, you know the things they were talking about. I remember one of them is a good. You know, I mean, I wish I was friends with him now, but his name was Jack. We all called him Jack, but his real name was Ian. Why would that make? Why did you make that shift? And this Ian's is what not he did. a bad name. This is what he did. This is what he did. This is what he did. Everyone called him Jack. Even was Jack his middle name? No idea. No idea. Just one of those guys. One of those guys in high school. You know, he had a guitar and he was quiet, but he always had a girlfriend, you know? Okay. Yeah, but it's Christian school, so you assume he's out there doing badass shit. Yeah. Anyway, I, you know, he started. we started talking together because already at that time I had, you know, been saying negative things about old JC, you know, been a little negative about the whole truth of the bible sure um, <laughs> sure sure i did four of them in there i did four four air quotes for the truth beginning and of the, end. the bible <laughs> and uh i remember he first he uh you know because we were talking about you know dane cook or whatever and he's like you know who's a real comedian bill hicks and i was like what oh so he was the first person to ever to turn me on to that and of course you know i get to george carlin from there but also in that same conversation he recommended for me to watch Fight Club. This, you know, 10th grader. And this you know, is a, yeah, is a 10th grader, okay. 10th grader in math class. He told me to watch Fight Club. And I'm like, because, you know, he's like, yeah, man, all that stuff about the Lord, all that bad stuff about the Lord. Yeah, watch Fight Club. He'll, you know, it'll start making sense then. <laughs> 
And, you know, I had no avenue to watch it. I guess, you know, my, I did have a personal computer. You talk about the internet. You know, my mom believes in a lot of things. Um, but um, one of the things she believed in is that computers were the future. She knew that. She, you know, she came from, you know, she was working in downtown at a law office and she already could see that computers were just this big new thing. You know, the sure. new thing. Of, <laughs> she worked there forever, you know, 20 years downtown. So she bought my own computer. And, you know, was that a mistake? She regrets it now, for sure. Considering, of course. <laughs> she considering regrets everything that's happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> considering my life, um, which you can find out about um, on my Instagram. It's very sad. It's okay. <laughs> Fight. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm I'm happy. <laughs> but um, so on my computer, I didn't really know too much. But my brother was actually going to a public school at the time, so he could play, uh, you know, in a better football club, American football club. Okay. <laughs> and he found out about LimeWire, so he had LimeWire already downloaded on my computer. Okay. So what? I my mom also had bought us iPod Nanos. Do you know? Do you I remember, remember the iPod, iPod Nano? Yeah, it's about yeah, this little and, tiny. Yeah, but you it's have like the you size have like, of a pack of gum. Yeah, like a big pack of gum, like mm-hmm. a <laughs> like a little fat thing. But the you know, you know, talk about this. The screen is like this big, minuscule. It's like it's like this big, right? But it was the only way I could. You know, it's the only thing I had to watch stuff. I didn't know how to make it work on my computer. I just didn't. I was young. I didn't put it together that I, you know, my window, my computer had a video player and. Whatever. Sure, sure. I was also afraid. So what I ended up doing is I downloaded Fight Club from LimeWire and put it on my iPod Nano. <laughs> and that's how I watched it. That's how I watched it. I watched oh The Dark Knight. I watched, I watched The Dark Knight that way, too. Uh, <laughs> a, a bootleg version. I remember um, you know, when Joker's hanging, when he's hanging upside down, I remember in the bootleg version, I saw a guy walking out of the movie theater <laughs> <laughs> on, the, my little, on my little iPod Nano. And that's how that's how I watched Fight Club. And maybe, dude, maybe I watched it a hundred times on the other thing. Maybe I, I remember being under my computer desk, you know, in bed, twelve midnight, just you know, bored as hell, you know, texting these girls, you know, that were my friends in high school. Sure. Just watch, just watching Fight Club. Wow, isn't that odd? Isn't that that's odd? So odd. And so I, you watched it. You you estimated at least a hundred times. I mean, probably probably more than. In, that. In the, in, in the period from when I was like 11 to like 13, probably, probably a hundred plus times. And then from, from then on, probably until I was like 20, I probably saw it another hundred. That's crazy. So it's really like seared into your brain. Cause I can't even like, I don't even think I've seen a movie. It's, 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 a tenth uh, it's of that amount of time. It's, it's acid burned into my brain. Okay? Yeah. It's cigarette burned into your brain. <laughs> Fight club reference. It's like, the acid, by the way. What do they put on them? What is that chemical? Hydrogen, whatever. It's hydrogen, a big thing. HCl, hydrogen chloride. Yeah, hydrogen chloride. There you go. That sounds right. I think like because I was I was rewatching this yesterday, and it occurred to me that I have not seen Fight Club since the first time I ever saw it. Like I remember Fight Club. The first time I ever watched it, I was um, maybe like sixteen or seventeen. I was dating um, a girl who had a little bit more leeway around her house than I did. She had a TV in her room, all that kind of stuff, right? Beautiful. (laughs) And we watched a lot of movies together that I was not going to have been allowed to watch at my house, theoretically. And one of those was Fight Club, which I very, like, I have a very distinct memory of, like, me and her lying on her bed. She had the TV mounted in the corner of her room. I remember we watched Fight Club. And it was this whole, like, I remember just, it's one of those, like, vivid teenage memories It's just kind of seared <laughs> in my brain, and I was like, this movie fucking rules, man. But then, yeah. I hadn't well, seen it again. Had a, oh, sorry, go ahead. You had a girlfriend when you were watching that. I think that is definitely an influencing factor. Like, if you have a woman right next to you watching that movie, completely different. Completely. Because, yes. you know, here I am alone. <laughs> yeah, Deep, you're watching it alone. alone. You're watching it Oof. the way that... <laughs> It's, it, it's got, you know, I had the, um, I had the, the ability to experience this movie and just watch the, like the anti-consumerist stuff and those themes and be like, wow, fucking sweet. Would any of this matter? Any of this shit? And, bo- and, and not have to go with any of the, uh, you know, the sort of like, 
the hyper masculine machismo y yeah. kind of things that also well, are such overt elements in this movie. I, yeah, well, I think, you know, my, the reason I'm filled with hate and resentment, mm -hmm. true resentment towards the movie is because everything is just madly misinterpretable. Every scene, every character has this, you know, of course, you know, talk about, you know, the, the formation of these movies. It's like, you know, you're not who you think you are. Nobody's what they think they are. Right. But truly, truly, every moment in this movie has a clear mis like misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. The first times you see any of these movies, and there are a lot of hyper masculine moments in this movie, but... You know, when I'm 11, you know, thinking about God all the time, I don't take those as, you know, I don't even, you know, my, my father's gone. I don't know anything about him. Sure. Yeah. I, I took the whole movie as some kind of shitty paradigm, some kind of how to build a worldview, some kind of like disgusting, because it's, it, it, you know, talk about, you know, taking it, taking the wrong message. I thought the movie was a, a lesson about how to be. Like how to just be. How to be. How to be. That's so that's so interesting because I do feel like you know I uh I I have like I said had not seen it since that initial watch. I remember it had such a big effect on me and I still rate it very highly even with that one watch. It still, you yeah. know, made it's my top 100, yeah. maybe my top 50. It's an incredible film. Like if you talk about film, like all the moments, mm -hmm. if it's just like great filmmaking, like, you know, I don't think filmmaking gets better than that moment where Marlo's going to try to commit suicide, you know? Yeah. All the, the odd transitions and the slow music and the phone ringing and, you know. It's really like this really showcases David Fincher's ability as a director to, to make a film that is so... Uh, it makes you feel so many different types of ways. <laughs> and now having watched it, yeah. having read over the years, all of this, um, all of this analysis and criticism analysis, analysis. and, and, ha and being able to sort of develop a worldview as uh, coming from being a teen to a young adult to now an adult adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never a man, right, Jay? <laughs> never a man. Yeah, never. You never look in the mirror and think I'm a man. <laughs> I never think that. Look how, I never... Big my, look how big my shoulders are right now, Jay. Do I seem like a man mm. to you? Here I am in this time. Here's the crazy thing: is there was a time in my life when I and I talk about this on stage a little bit. I might you might have heard me do this bit, but there was a time in my life where like I was really obsessed with like pickup artist stuff, like pickup <laughs> yeah. artist literature. I read the game extensively. I was all up on becomeaplayer.com and all this other all this other bullshit. And like mm -hmm. that was my version, I think, for of me of you watching Fight Club <laughs> at age even is me reading like becomeaplayer.com when I was twelve or thirteen years old. But that's the thing; it's like I get to watch this movie now, and I can see all of the um, the symbolism and the and the uh, oh god, what's the word? The the uh, the commentary that it's doing, right? I can right. see all of the satire. Yeah. Exactly. I can yeah. see what it is saying and the subtext so much more clearly than I was able to when I was 16 years old watching this movie for the first time in my girlfriend's bedroom. Yeah, well, I mean, I just, I mean, there's a, you know, talk about a question that is, you know, burdens me. It's like, you know, is your movie good if every 13 year old who watches it becomes intolerable? <laughs> is your movie, is your movie good? <laughs> Is your movie good that if anybody who watches it, you know, who, who doesn't have a true identity of themselves becomes this weird fucking, you know, crazy guy? Is your and movie drinking? good if <laughs> after watching it, the person who watches it immediately thinks everything about that movie is right and true <laughs> and that's how I need to live my life from now on? It, the movie is just, it's such a, it's so like. You know, you think you think everybody is you in that movie. Like everybody is a, like a representation mm -hmm. of that person you maybe are in your worst or at your best. You know, I mean, they, everyone has this clear role, but you know, you don't get the satire. Do you think you think kids shouldn't watch that movie? Right? Do you believe in the NC seventeen rating? Do you believe in the <laughs> Do you believe in the restriction? I definitely do not think that this should be watched. If you're going to watch this as a kid. You shouldn't watch this alone. Like this is a movie. I do think it's an important movie, and I still think it's a real. Like I think it's a great movie. I can't 
I can't turn my back on this movie, even having rewatched it, especially now. <laughs> I I like it and appreciate it even more than I did then. But this is definitely not a movie that you should watch without somebody sitting next to you or being able to like yeah. go into a class the next day and discuss it with adults and discuss it with people who understand <laughs> what subtext is and what some of these themes are and uh, I, I still and don't like how the subtext. I think yeah. that the like the the overt thing to me is like you watch the narrator go through this journey of thinking that he needs to actualize himself by being a uh, a degenerate who like fights in parking lots and basements <laughs> of bars and shows up to work and is an asshole to everybody, but thinks that that's like, that's the way that I can be alive and be a man. And there's, you know, a, a, a lot of other people in this movie, especially when you factor in the element of people going, you know, the, the, the whole, um, the self-help group kind of stuff, right? As, and these people who are like seeking to become a better, more actualized version of themselves. But then you see how easily that is subverted and you see how easily that kind of messaging can seep into someone's brain and radicalize them in a way that like, <laughs> it's really, it's fucked up. Yeah, and well, I have the-, the distance now to be able to say that and be like, this is a, like a, la- like an important, like capital I important movie, especially for right now. In the culture. True. In the culture. Yeah. Well, I think what's most interesting about the movie is it's not a metaphor. Mm-mm. It's not a metaphor. Not I, I remember watching this thing, like everything was like some kind of allegory. You know what I mean? You take Bob. Take Bob and his bitch tits, right? Bob's bitch tits, yes. Take Bob and his bitch tits. You know, when you superficially look at the movie, you know, as an adult or something, mm-hmm. or whatever they call those guys nowadays, adults, um, you look at them and you go, oh, this is just a man who has been feminized. Yes. You know, there's a big masculine man who used to be buff, was told to do the things he did, and... He became, you know, his wife left him. He got bitch tits. He's a feminine man now. When I first watched that movie, I thought it was like, this guy is an allegory for everything that can go wrong in a person's life, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like, because if you really, you know, if you look at it like, you know, if you go one farther than you're supposed to, it's like, you know, the antithesis of everything he ever wanted happened. Right. And you think he's this, this, you know, how do I, how do you say it? You know, it's like a, it's like a, it starts with a V. It's like I it's like kind of like the word vicarious, you know? Yeah. He's like a he's like a like an effigy. Like I think a vicari- yeah, a um uh a to- what's the word? Effigy, effigy works, right? Cuz you're basically yeah. looking at him and being like this guy's a symbol. This guy stands for something. When and yeah. that's the thing the guys in the, later on in the movie do <laughs> and they make him a symbol, they make him a martyr, they make him stand was. for something, but he, he never, never was. was. Yeah, and that's, You're you know, right. that's the that's the true interpretation of the movie. But then you can see how it's so easily to get fucked up. Mm-hmm. So easily to to just just miss, dismiss it by that little that little inch and you come out with the complete opposite turn of where you know this guy, you know, they they're, you know, either you know the culture, the the, the mayhem group, the you know, all the all my, mayhem, yeah. all my all my all those friends I had in high school. Um <laughs> and how they make him something he's not. And you know, there's I just, and I just I, I get confused talking about the movie. Is that is that is your movie good? That if any time anyone talks about it, they just completely lose the thread. <laughs> well, I think it's just burned into your brain. You have I feel like you probably because of you having built a life like a deep internal life on this movie, a personality, truly. Yeah, you probably have a hard time. Perhaps from like an intellectual standpoint, and I would imagine almost certainly from like an emotional, deeply felt standpoint. <laughs> We've had a moment. Kyle has <laughs> Kyle has broken down like he has hugged Bob and his bitch tits. Um, right. But I think that you probably have a hard time being able to intellectualize this movie and look at it from – from a standpoint of like, this is where, you know, because you, because you were the guy who like hit the curve and went the wrong way on the curve, instead of being able to look at this movie and be like, this is a, this is a, this is a movie that is like a vital element that people should watch and being able to look at it 
from that standpoint. You have so much subjective subjectivity tied into your experience with this movie. Well, I think, well, I think that the other part of the problem is that you can't not you can't ignore it, right? You can't just mm-hmm. you can't just you know brush by it because you can just brush by it. The movie's about you know being a cuck, you know. <laughs> Because it's big, it's big cucking going on. Eddie, Ed, old, old Eddie Ed's just cucking the f out of old Brady P. You know, watching him live, watching him fuck. You know, <laughs> and then it then it ends like how every cuck should end is where you know someone gets shot in the head. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I I was, I, yeah. Do you do you like cucking? I don't want to cuck. I feel like if any time I would my, cuck, I would enjoy. Thing. I would enjoy cucking if I get to kill the other guy at the end. That would. Be <laughs> That's if you want to be a so, fight cuck. Yeah, I'd be a fight cuck. <laughs> fight club. Fight cuck. I fight think. Club. The way I preach, the way I approach thinking about this movie now is like I, you know, I am somebody who is a sober person. I am no stranger to twelve step groups. I, I haven't drank in a year, Jane. But do you go to twelve? Do you go to any sort of twelve step or support group? Those guys creep me out. See, here's the thing. So I have begun to those groups for quite some time, right? And I and and that was the first, like the first inkling of me having uh, an experience where I'm like. I'm watching this movie and this is greater than it was when I was a young person watching this movie. When I was a teen, when I was a fucking teenager watching this movie, Kyle, a boy, just a boy, just Just a a horny boy boy (laughs) trying to get to the end and add a Pixies song to my, uh, sexy time playlist. But this movie, like from that moment, I, I saw the support group and I was like, I know, People like that. I know people who need something in their lives that is like that. And here's the, the, as that progressed, the moment that I think is like the ultimate turn for me is when, uh, when the chemical burn happens, the whole lie, the lie on the hand scene. And there's this moment where Edward Norton's character, the narrator is, he's being, he's like trying to meditate. He's trying to go to his, uh, his cave Mm-hmm. The penguin cave, the slide slide. The penguin the cave, slide slide. <laughs> uh, also, great, great cinematic moment. Um, yeah, slide. Tee hee. Slide. <laughs> was it a real penguin? It was no. a CGI. That's penguin. a CGI oh. penguin for CGI sure. CGI penguin. Yeah. Okay. Um, but he goes to. He tries to go to his place, and Tyler Durden is saying, "Stay with the pain. The pain is what's real." Yeah. And. It's so like watching that scene for me now is it's watching somebody who like is so easily tricked into believing that they need to ride out their pain and allow their pain to consume their life instead of riding out the pain and allowing it to pass. Yeah. You got a lot. Yeah, of do- you got a lot of dogs who disagree with me in the background about my interpretation uh, of this. Scene. Are there a lot of dogs? I'm in, I'm in Mexico. They live on the street. <laughs> they live on the street. They're dangerous. These lots are of they dog. A- lots of dog action happening. Lots of dogs who also agree with you and hate Fight Club. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, even even when tell me if the dogs are too much to maybe I can do something about it. I have a gun. Um. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't need to go that far, but maybe. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, see course, if you can you know, get. Oh yeah, humor, of course. My, You're yeah, humoring. Humor. Anyway, um, you know, even when you said it, it's like, you know, it just occurred to me now, you know, lie is, you know, L Y E L I E. Oh, the symbolism, you know, because you know, when I first watched that movie, I guess I thought that I thought the lie was like a representation of the all the pain we all go through, you know. Of sure. And maybe it, well, it's that, like, that's know, the thing. That's what he's selling the narrator on. Mm-hmm. He's selling the narrator on you have to feel this pain because you don't have you don't have a life. Yeah. You don't have so anything you else. Have to, you don't have anything else. You have to have this pain in order to, f- and, and pain is a better thing to feel than, and that will allow you to feel nothing. When really, he already was starting to feel stuff and deal with his feelings in a much more normal and healthy way. Yeah. You know, even though he's a tourist and still doing like a sort of a weird thing of uh, going to support groups when he doesn't have any of these problems in order to like cry so he can fall asleep like that. You yeah, know, you got, you got some fucking problems. You should go see a therapist about it, dude. But that moment for me was like, this is the, this is the thing that's calcifying this movie is like a commentary on how people who are seeking something can be tricked into going down yeah. the wrong path. 
Yeah, and if your movie tricks those people in the same way that you're satirizing, is it good? <laughs> I don't know. I see that's the thing. It's like it's made for adults. You know, there's something we it's all It's clearly to made for adults. Yeah. So it's something we have to all have to accept about life is that sometimes you're not ready for stuff. You're just not ready. You can't sure. expose yourself to it. You know, I guess, you know, you talk about it as a stand up, you know what I mean? There's certain there's periods of your career where you just don't watch you don't watch anything. You don't watch mm-hmm. any stand up. Because you're afraid. You're afraid of that little that little piece that's just gonna fucking take you the wrong way, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean I think you have you ever read Roger Ebert's review of this movie? Uh no, no, no. I so, don't no, no, absolutely not. I don't read. Did you ask me to? Did you ask if I've read? <laughs> yes. Have you nah. read in your entire life? You've got that nah. book in the background just for show. It's a it's a friar's book. It's jokes. The so, friar's club roast. A thousand <laughs> jokes. From the, so yeah. Fight Club is a movie that Roger Ebert famously did not like very much. He gave it two stars out of four. Was Roger was, gay? Roger Ebert? No, nah, I don't think nah, so. Okay. But he has. Definitely a big, big, big axe to grind with this movie. He thinks that it's a thrill ride masquerading as philosophy. He thinks it's promising first act is followed by second that panders to macho sensibilities and a third act that is pure trickery. And this is, you know, this is the telling thing too to me is that he says in this paragraph, of course, Fight Club itself does not advocate Durden's philosophy. It is a warning against it, I guess. One critic I like <laughs> says it makes a telling point about the bestial nature of man and what can happen when the numbing effects of day-to-day drudgery cause people to go a little crazy. I think it's the numbing <laughs> effects of movies like this that cause people to go a little crazy. Although sophisticates will be able to rationalize the movie as an argument against the behavior it shows, my guess is that the audience will like the behavior but not the argument. And that... Is it's my life. That's your life. <laughs> this is the problem. Yeah, I mean, how how could I never have like the the moral? You know, there's there's nothing that movie shows to you in comparison, mm-hmm. right? There's nothing. There's no, you know, you talk about. You know, I showed you your. Uh, there's talking about this for a second. As you know, China. You know, China. You ever heard of it? How they? Yes, it's a country. <laughs> they. You ever uh, heard of that place? But they just, yeah, they they changed the ending in this new release that they have of the movie on their streaming platform, Tencent. Which, you know, which, you know thank God, because, you know, you know, I never read the book, okay? I tell you, the movie's based on a book. Mm-hmm. I never read it. I don't want to read it. It's I a have, good book. It's a really, really good book. And my, my, my friends with four-inch dicks say so, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they tell me it's great. <laughs> um and how that movie ends, how that book ends, is the guy, the narrator goes into the psych work. Mm-hmm. He goes into the psych ward. He blows up the buildings, and then he goes into the psych ward. Correct. Which to me is definitely, oh, that's the that's what that's that that end piece of comparison that the whole movie needed. Because I watch old Eddie N blow up the towers. Mm-hmm. I watch him like a fucking you know like the goddamn nine eleven. I watch him commit nine eleven right on these credit card companies. And at the end of it, I'm like, is that a good idea? Should we blow up the credit card companies? <laughs> Seems like a good idea. How could that go bad? I think, and this is the thing. It's like in the, in the ending that the Chinese, uh, yeah, what do they do? Of the film has, yeah, what do they do? I don't know what they do. It's kind of, it's, it kind of does a little bit of both. So this is literally, so they have, um, a title card that just appears. Right before they're supposed to, sh- right before the, um, like a, like a Joe Rogan, a COVID misinformation disclaimer. Like it's that. 12 <laughs> minutes. It's 12 minutes shorter than the original. So this places the, the, this title card that appears after he goes and talks to the cops, but before you actually see the buildings blow up. And so this is a, a, a title card that says the following through the clue presented by Tyler the police rapidly figured out the whole plan and arrested all <laughs> criminals, successfully preventing the bomb from exploding. After the trial, Tyler was sent to a lunatic asylum receiving psychological treatment. He was discharged from the hospital in 2012. Adorable. <laughs> Which, I mean, that happens sort of in the why, book. Why, why 2012? Why 2012? Is that- I don't know why 2012. Just, I guess he's been in there for a long time. He's been in there for 12 years. But that's the thing. It's like even in the in that version, you still get the ending of Tyler knowing that he's he needs help and going to seek the help. But in this version, as cool as cool as it is for somebody to shoot themselves in the head to like get rid of their 
their their second personality that has caused uh, terrorist incidents to happen. It doesn't really give you an actual answer to how to address this stuff in your own life. Right. Well, you know, when I first saw him, you know, shoot himself, right? Mm -hmm. I had thought it was like a, you know, like, like Jesus Christ, like Jesus Christ come back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, like you need to, you need to end the, you create, like you create this example of yourself, right? There's this example of yourself. You martyr you, yourself, right? You martyr and you martyr that effort, you know, like, uh, you know, we all, you know, we all strive to be something, right? We all have this ideal of who we could be and we all work towards that. Mm -hmm. And once, and once you get there, what do you do then? Well, you fucking blow your brains out. You fucking, you bring, <laughs> you, you take that guy down and you become, you truly become him because now sure. you're, you're, own, you're, now you're your own ideal. It, it felt so simple to me. It felt like so obvious, like, uh, oh yeah, that's what, that's what it is. <laughs> but again, you know, just completely missing the point. Like how, like how, like how the narrator misses his brain. Well, he he aims to not hit his whole brain. He just wants to hit really? the one part. Yeah. No, I thought, he doesn't want to kill like, himself. He wants to just get like, rid of Tyler. I thought he was like a loser who like, can't make a good shot. You know? No. <laughs> like he made stance. a perfect shot. <laughs> uh, Here's a crazy thing. I don't know if this happened on, on your end at all. It definitely – I was not uh, involved enough in – uh, youth group stuff at the time for this have happened, but maybe you noticed it a little bit. Um, being at a Christian school where a bunch of kids were also watching Fight Club. Fight Club, this is according to the Wikipedia page. Fight Club had a significant impact on evangelical Christianity in the areas of Christian discipleship and masculinity. A number of churches called their cell groups Fight Clubs with a stated purpose of meeting regularly to beat up the flesh and believe in the gospel of grace. Some churches, especially Mars Hill Church in Seattle, whose pastor Mark Driscoll was obsessed with the film, picked up the film's emphasis on masculinity and rejection of self care. Oh, that, that just that just sounds that just sounds like the beginning of January sixth. You know, <laughs> it just sounds like <laughs> sounds like it sounds like what those people were doing right before then. Well, that's the thing too. It's like I watched yeah. this and I was like, this really is a movie that I think a lot more people need to see now and analyze in a way that you could. I'm sure that there's like de-radicalization things that people can look at in this movie and, and, and also see like, Oh, this is a map to radicalization. Like this is how it happens. Yeah. It happens when you, when you take a certain, especially men, right? Because we are loser, 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 dudes. loser men, loser dudes who are, who don't know that they're allowed to talk about their feelings and do they're it not. in a healthy way. Cause they're not, they're you gotta, like you gotta be, you gotta <laughs> punch yourself and punch other people in a parking lot. And then yeah, you go blow up a bomb. Um, but that's the thing. It's like all of this, this is, a, you know, this is a, a, a roadmap to radicalization. I think that is, has some like academic benefit to be studied. And I'm sure that there's probably some who have done it, but like, I don't understand why nobody's talking about this movie from that standpoint in, in pop culture. Maybe well, they are. Like, maybe I just don't know about it, but no, no, they aren't. They aren't. I'm listening. Um, I'm on Reddit. I know everything. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I scroll. I scroll. I know. Uh, well, that's that's the, that's the other part of it where it's like, you know, you, it's, it's an, another way to misinterpret the movie is to think of it as like, you know, enforcing masculine ideas. Because, you know, I mean, I, I'm not here to be Jordan Peterson, no matter how good I look in this time. But there, there yeah, there's a thing against being a man. Yeah. And that's why the, that's why the movie isn't, you know, it still is not going to penetrate it because that's, you know. They think it's another thing, you know, piling on. That's a, I mean, that's a great point. I could see, yeah, because it's definitely like for all of its machismo and its and its posturing is like a, a highly masculine stuff. I can see why some people would be like, nah, they're just making fun of me. Which is <laughs> there? I don't think this. I think you're right. I don't think this film is an allegory. I don't think it's making fun. It's really good. Like it's good. It's got good satire. It's got good commentary. Funny as heck. The movie's funny as heck. It's so funny. funny. As just, but it, just dirting with the nunchucks and, you know, yeah. and the, the, the fight against himself. You know, I guess now it's a little, you know, there's a lot of things that you see like that. But, you know, where, you know, it's like he's throwing himself down the stairs in the CCTV camera. Mm -hmm. That shit is just, that's it's just great. pure comedy. Pure great comedy. comedy. Pure comedy. But yeah. it's all played so straight. It's all played so down the barrel that if you watch this movie and you did not pick up on the subtext, it is because you are not like it's because you're not looking for it. <laughs> it's because you don't know to look for it. Perhaps I would say that I, it's not, 
it's not any fault other than the the viewer who's watching it for not understanding the 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 the, the subtext being right there for you for it being as clear as fucking day and instead of you as a viewer looking at it and being like but it could mean this and this it could mean this and this and this and this and this and drawing uh uh you know a corkboard map with string in your brain yeah which is totally easy to do watching this movie i think yeah well eh, man it is it is unbelievable that you know a guy like david fincher i feel like he relied on the age restriction you think that he relied you didn't even think about kids didn't even think about think about the children, Jay. <laughs> what about the children? <laughs> Why think about the children when you're making this movie? It's not a movie isn't, for kids. Isn't all art made for children? Isn't that the idea? Because there, there's a point where you do realize that you know people are kind of hopeless. You know, you, either you know you're 35 and your brain's stuck. You know, all the plasticity is gone. All the sweet, sweet plasticity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not, you know, you're, you know, how is it, how hard is it to learn? How hard is it to change? You know, these things are deemed impossible sometimes, you know? So, you know, when I, you know, when I make a joke, uh, you know, why, when did I fall in love with comedy? When did I start, uh, you know, when I was a kid, you know, sure. you know, I really, you know, you know, this is, you know, this is why all the fascist governments are into children, you know? That's oh yeah. Cause they all, they're easily impressionable. And you got to get them. You got to get them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, wh- why would you make a movie? if not to imp- impress on people, you know, and if you're trying to impress on people, you have to acknowledge that the most Im- easily impressed, if that's, if I'm using that word right in this context are, you know, the, the 11 to 14 year olds, the 11 to 17. Sure. I, I think that you're not making movies. I can't speak to David Fincher, right? I can't no. say why he's making this movie. But my guess is that he probably was not making this movie to radicalize teenagers. <laughs> now, Even it's a byproduct what of what happened, surely. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. – but that's the thing. It's like – there. Are, and I remember when it came out, uh, reading uh, about what happened when it came out, rather. I don't remember when it came out. I was not allowed to watch anything close to this when it came out. Not all 99. But there, was, there were a lot of people who were afraid of – copycat stuff happening this movie right there was a lot of people who didn't know how to market it there were a lot of people who thought that it was going to be a, 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 a level of catastrophe um especially you know columbine had happened earlier that year and uh and people thought it was just going to be you know spawn some copycats and you know what the thing is like if I've if I've learned anything over the the many years of like consuming media that is violent and people say they're going to spawn copycats is that the people who are the copycats of those beha- of that behavior that is shown in those movies are not people who are mentally well. Yeah, typically people who would do it anyway who are looking for any excuse. Exactly. For any reason, any reason. And especially their defense lawyers are looking for any excuse. Hey, don't talk about those guys. They're my friends. I need uh, need a defense lawyer eventually. Eventually. Soon enough. Uh, Soon enough. I know (laughs) know a good one. I'll hook you up. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh. Think about that. Surprise. Yeah. Um, That's a permission structure. And if I could talk about it, you know, because, you know, what did I really do? What did I really do? so fucked up in my life you know what did i do that was so wrong or you know because the movie obviously you know and, and if truly anything i think it embraces you know anti-authoritarianism you know it's like anti-authority that's yeah. what it is it's, it's anti-authority it's anarchic it's an, it is yeah. anti-consumerist yeah well you know talk about it, you know, the unmarkability for it you know it's like you're an idiot if you're trying to market the movie in the first place mm-hmm. it's like you know how dare you but what did I, what did I, what did, what did that movie make me think it was okay to do? What? what did it make me think? It was, it was, it made me think people were wrong. It made me think that whatever, you know, position people had, it, it was like, uh, you know, it was based out of frailty, out of fear. Sure. You know, cause you know, of course little, little Eddie N, you know, he's a, he's a Freddy cat. Mm-hmm. He's a big Freddy cat in the movie. He's a big Freddy cat. And I I thought the movie was trying to like, you know, put down all the people who are afraid to do something. Sure. And so when I look at how I treated people and even the thing, you know, God, you know me, Jay, I was, I was out there driving an El Camino drunk as hell. 
Mm-hmm. So you know, selling, you know, selling little, 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 little things to kids, little seventeen-year-olds, drugs. Mm-hmm. I don't regret that. I guess it's a cool story to tell. Yeah, you don't regret things. You just, you know, do them, right? You do them and you learn from them. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Theoretically. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I guess yeah. I, I think it does bother me that I ha- I have treated people like you know they didn't know shit, and maybe they still don't. But, you know, treating people like they don't know shit, the only thing it does is, you know, confirm that they never will, you know? You treat, sure. people, like, you treat people like they're unteachable, well, you know, welcome. They're going yeah. to be, you're not, at least you're not going to be able to. Yeah. That is, that is interesting. But teaching, treating people like you're, they, they're unteachable only belies the fact that you are also unteachable and that That's you're a so big set projection. in stone. Big projection. Life is projection. projection. You, only, you only notice things wrong in other people that are wrong with yourself. You know, you only speak up about something that you find in your own life. It is interesting. You know, people, you know, people only know about the stuff they know. Mm-hmm. And you can't get, you can't get mad at people for that. I guess that's you know, going, you know, going to Christian school. I always, I always was dealing with like ignorance. I was ignorant myself, of course, but of oh, course, sure. you know, not to the, you know, not to the, to the limit that my rich, Christian, you know, girls who hung out in their little mansions, you know, not to their extent. And I, I, I treated them poorly because of it. Yeah. Like, like they needed to wake up. You know, it's so crazy that as teenagers, we think everybody needs to like, we all, I think at some point develop fight club or not some sort of anti rebellious, whatever, uh, the thing that we had grown up to and grown up within, we typically rebel against it at some point. And it's so funny that as teenagers, we have this moment of like, we need to wake up. Like the world is bad and needs to change. And then after a while, you are given a chance to, you're given a chance to wake up and you're given a chance to see the world from not this like, crazy myopic perspective that you had built into you. And sometimes people do great things with that. Sometimes people don't do anything with it. And sometimes people don't even get to that. People don't, sometimes people don't make it that far. Or they take the wrong message. They, they continue on with that where it's like, you know, they, they up it, they up the ante, you know, Mm -hmm. other people are still the problem. Other people are even more the problem. I've been great. You know, Go on Twitter. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> go less. How about everybody goes, this is the thing. Go less on Twitter. I don't have a Twitter. I don't have one. Good I, barely for you. Use Insta- I barely use Instagram. I mean, God, you know, if I'm mad at them for anything, it's, you know, it's they're making money off of my data, my data, mm-hmm. my data. Right. Give me that money. Jesus Christ. Uh, you know what I think I got to watch again because of this is, uh, is the social network. Never really seen it. Never went all the way through it. I think maybe I watched, you know, half an hour on TNT one time. But. This, the social network is also great, but I haven't seen it in a long time. But I feel like David Fincher might actually be one of the, he's a great director, but he might be a great satirist. Mm. Like a great satire director. Like I think Fight Club works on a level of of, of commentary against what it is, you know, what people take away from it. And I think that the whole premise of the social network is like, Oh, this is what it takes to like become rich and powerful, but you got to fuck up your entire life and all the relationships that you've had in order to get there. Hmm. And you still have this lead character in Mark Zuckerberg. Oh, who is Mark, Mark a oh, huge villain. Mark, he sucked, baby. Anyway, I'm going to rewatch the social network now. I think you should probably do that. You should, you should watch it, watch it. Well, I, I guess, you know, I always wanted to ask you this cause you're so, you're so interested in movies and you know, I have a lot of respect for you, Jay, but um, what, Fire what away. makes you, what makes you watch a movie? Cause I, I look, I look inside my own brain and it's like, how many times have I watched something and just taken the wrong lesson? How many times have I just watched something and just completely missed the point, wasted two and a half hours, <laughs> You know, and I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to continue to watch things that are going to influence me poorly. Talk about undue influence. Undue influence. You know, are things in my life supposed to change me? I don't I know. I think, you know, 
I don't look at I don't look at films and movies. Two different things, by the way. I don't look at those. <laughs> I don't look at a thing and say like I want to go watch that. Like I find you know now, as somebody who's watched a lot of movies and continues to watch a lot of movies, that I really only can truly like love a film or think it's great. And if I am moved by it in some sort of, like if it emotionally takes me to a place that I leave the movie feeling different, truly feeling different as a, like a human being, perhaps like having seen or felt an experience that the movie was, was showing me. And that can be, that could be something as simple as, you know, um, uh, in climax, the Gaspar Noé movie, a movie that is still the best depiction of doing drugs in a movie that I've ever seen in terms of having a bad trip and making me feel as I left the fo- as I left the movie theater, feeling like mm-hmm. I'd had a bad trip and yeah. feeling like that sort of wobbly, like what is, what is happening in my brain? Like that kind of feeling. I, I, I I got to say that's a great, that's a great film, even though I felt deeply, deeply uncomfortable by the end of it. Um, Taking on the flip side where a movie like uh, fantastic Mr. Fox or is that, the, is, that the one, is that the one with Johnny Depp? No, that's um, uh, George Clooney. Okay. But fantastic <laughs> Mr. Fox, a movie that I think really is like Mr. Foxy. Well, Georgie, Georgie there C. you go. But it's a movie that's like, it brings me to a point where I'm like, this is, it's so funny. It's so heartfelt. And it's so, it says a lot of great things about the relationship between a family um, in a way that made me just like feel pure joy. And I think that it takes a movie, you know, if I'm going to feel something, I don't necessarily want to have like my mind changed by something watching a movie. I, I don't need to go like reaffirm an opinion that I have by watching a movie or, or be presented with something that like could change an opinion. I'll, if that happens, cool. That's a wonderful extra bonus surprise. But I think that like, if I'm consuming art in order to develop a personality, <laughs> then I'm approaching it wrong. I, I consume yeah. art. I consume movies and TV to gauge taste. I consume it to gauge like where I'm at, um, what I what I care about, what I feel about, but not necessarily like I'm not trying to still carve out chunks of my personality and like paint this broad picture of who I am. And so I don't I mean, I don't tend to go watch movies that I I, unless I think I'm really going to hate it and we're watching it with (laughs) a bunch of people for fun. I don't go watch seek out movies that I don't think I'm going to like. And a lot of people, I've talked to a lot of people about this podcast who feel the same way. And I think that's pretty standard, but I also want to give movies chances. And sometimes some, something comes up that's like, this looks weird. Maybe I'll like it and I'll watch it and I won't like it. Um, But that, Hey, Hey, I'm I'm totally happy to have that experience uh, too. And I guess what what bothers me is like, uh, you know, I don't know the value of my own uh, feeling or opinion about something, you know, I'll, I'll feel something about, you know, I'll, I'll watch, you know, I guess, you know, I guess I like sports, you know, I'll watch a sport and it'll maybe feel some way, you know, and, mm-hmm. but what's the, what's the value of that? You know, what, what do I get out of feeling something? You know, is, is it wrong? You to get the feeling. Supposed- that's, uh, that, so there's value. Oh, that's there's value so in the feeling. <laughs> that's just adorable. There's it's value in it. Is there? Yeah. How? Where? This is how, this is how fight club told you are. And this is where I think we got to, we got to wrap up because we're going, we're going real long. Yeah, you're Um, right. This is how fight club told you are, right? Is that like, you are as, as the narrator is shown in the movie, you are, you have this idea that like, there's only one way to feel and it is to, uh, to accept that life is pain and that nothing else is valid. And the narrator, early on in the movie, before he meets Tyler, he, sure, he doesn't like his life, but he is experiencing an acceptance of that feeling in a way that he hadn't prior. You know, it manifests in, in his insomnia with and the development of the second personality, but he is accepting the feelings instead of just trying to, like, 
live allowing them to never show up. Like allowing feelings to show up is such a, I think it's a vital part of the human experience, not to like shape your personality or anything, but just to like allow yourself a chance to, to feel. Be normal. Feeling is normal. I think it's super normal, man. And I think that like, I love, there's so many people who like don't really give a shit about feeling. And that is, that is the saddest thing to me is when people are like, but why feel? <laughs> Look, sometimes feeling isn't fun. Sometimes it's fucking lame and, and doesn't, obviously it doesn't feel good. There's a whole breadth of negative emotions we talked about at the very beginning of, the, of this episode. But I think that if you open yourself up to the possibility of, of being moved, then you will develop a, a, a better understanding of what you like, what you don't like. Your barometer will get a My little bit more finely tuned. Is that, that, is that that thing Steve Harvey talks about? My barometer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I think that your emotional barometer will get more finely tuned. You'll be able to pinpoint yeah. better stuff. Yeah, I really, I really got to work on it. And of course, I know I feel a lot of feelings and sometimes you know, they're uncontrollable. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm working on it a lot, actually. And uh, All feelings you know, are uncontrollable. Truly, truly. Always. Hey, can I, can I, can I, you know, talk about movies all the time. Can I plug mine? I yes, please. Great time to plug. Cause it's the end yeah. of the podcast. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I'm an interesting guy. I don't know, but I, uh, I made a movie. It's uh, all in black and white. It's a, like a Charlie Chaplin sort of, you know, I'm, you know, I, I screened it at third wheel. It's a comedy club in, uh, East Hollywood uh-huh. on Santa Monica Boulevard. Great club. I screen. Yeah. I screen, it's amazing. I'm running a monthly there. Um, Anyway, I screened it, and uh, I was told it's a classically avant-garde film. What it is, it's uh, seven comedians doing their material to a, uh, an audience that are all dressed up in white masks and black robes, and they say crazy stuff, and they're like a gorilla sketch team. It's very odd. Classically weird, I'm told. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, you know, I'm influenced by a lot of stuff, you know, Fight Club first and foremost, and then the Bible, and then my mommy. Um, <laughs> and of course my brother and all the, my friends and family. Uh, but I, and of course all the comedians that I've interacted with and spoken to for the last nine years, eight and a half. Um, and I, and I made something that was $7,000 and I hope it's, uh, I hope people enjoy it. It's impossible to take the wrong message from. It's impossible. <laughs> it's a very clear, <laughs> it's, it's a one well, you beat David film. Fincher there. <laughs> um, where can they watch it? What's it called? It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Uh, uh, my channel is KGrid03. I mean, you can look at it on my Instagram. The link's right there. Also the same name. And the full title of the movie is called Strange Audience, a stand-up comedy head case. Fun. Fun. Go watch it. I, I got to watch the whole thing. I've seen clips and bits here and yeah, there, but yeah, I honestly, see the whole thing. Honestly, it's such a crazy uh, premise that um, I did show you a really early version of it. And the fact that you just get you gave an okay really was a weight off my shoulders. I'm like, all right, I'm not completely insane. Thank God. Thank God. (laughs) Sometimes you got to put that weirdo shit out there, man. I like it. Got it. Got it. Especially if you're one of them, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I can be found at diet J on Twitter and Instagram, jlightcomedy.com for any show dates. Um, a lot of stuff in LA, a little stuff in Kansas city this weekend, Kansas. Oh, I love Kansas city. I was there. Uh, I was there October 31st, 2020. Wonderful town. Wonderful town. I, uh, also, I did, I did a man on the street show for about a month from um, October 16th to November 21st. I drove across America. You can find that also on a separate YouTube channel. Anyway. Anyway. Um, Kyle, thanks again, man. You're the best, Jay. We'll see you soon. We'll see you soon. I'll this see you been, soon. This has been Blockbusting. Go see something good for a change. 